Jonathan, and thank you so much for inviting me to, in, to join this conversation. What a terrific program this is. I'm so happy to be a part of it. Um, I'm really excited about this chance to share my work with you. Um, I definitely want to say a special thank you to Melissa Raleigh for all of her hard work and for making this possible. And um, I think it's so wonderful that you all are reading Britt Bennett's mesmerizing book, The Vanishing Half. And I really hope that through this talk, I can give you some historical context around racial passing that might help you to kind of engage even more deeply with, with the novel. Um, and I'm so glad that this is on Zoom because I'm so glad that we can really have a conversation and, and please feel free to ask questions during the talk. And, and um, as Melissa said, there will definitely be time after the talk as well. Um, but, but it's so nice when, when, when this can be more interactive um, since you know it's unfortunate that we can't be together, but it's nice that we can make it as interactive as possible. So, um, so you can only imagine how thrilled I was when Britt Bennett told New York Magazine that she read my book while she was writing The Vanishing Half. And I've had the honor to um, be on NPR talking about passing with Britt Bennett. And as a historian, I'm so grateful to Britt Bennett for writing such an extraordinary book and for bringing this fascinating topic um, into the public conversation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, there we go. Um, and let's see. Okay, I just want to, sorry, I'm going to do that one more time. I'm going to share this. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, so what I thought I would do is I would start just by saying a little bit about the inspiration for my book project, kind of how I came to this topic. And I'll start by saying that this project was inspired by a story that my aunt told me about a distant cousin of ours who grew up on the south side of Chicago in the 1930s. And the story begins with a parade, the historic Bud Billiken parade, an annual parade that continues to this day. On a sizzling summer morning in August, my cousin leapt from her bed to find the best spot to view the parade. She joined a crowd that numbered in the thousands and she cheered as drum majors, baton twirlers and celebrities in convertibles passed by. She ran out to the floats to touch the parade's anointed king and queen and caught the candy that the participants tossed to her. The parade was a South Side institution. And at a time when racial tensions ran high, when black families squeezed into overcrowded kitchenettes, and when black children knew not to venture beyond the boundaries of their neighborhood, the Bud Billiken Parade evoked a deep sense of race pride, community, and togetherness. For one day a year, black children could imagine that the city of Chicago was all theirs. Now our cousin could not have known that this would be her last time hearing the marching bands and the cheering crowds. Unlike many black parents, she would not share this experience with her children. She was black, but she was very light skinned. In fact, she looked white. And at the insistence of her mother, after she graduated from high school, she would move far away from Chicago's South Side to Los Angeles to live the rest of her life as a white woman. It was not her choice. She pleaded with her mother. She did not want to leave her family, her friends, and the only life that she had ever known but her mother was determined and the matter was decided. Years later, after she had married a white man and raised white children who knew nothing of her past, she received a very inconvenient telephone call. It was her mother 
and she was calling to tell her that her father was dying and that she must come home immediately. Despite these dire circumstances, she would never return to Chicago's South Side. The young girl who had once sat on a curb in Chicago's most historic black neighborhood to watch America's largest black parade was a white woman now, and there was simply no turning back. After my aunt told me this story, it, it haunted me. So I spent 12 years wrestling with this curious phenomenon of passing. Conventional wisdom tells us that a history of passing cannot be written, that those who passed left no trace in the historical record. But I believed that the sources were out there for historians just waiting to be discovered. I went into the archives looking for ghosts, hoping to tell their stories. To find these ghosts, historians must seek out unconventional sources. These sources revealed passing to be a deeply individualistic practice, but also a fundamentally social act with enormous social consequences. The iconic image of the heartbroken yet sympathetic black mother who must not speak a word nor lay eyes on her white looking child in public, lays bare the painful consequences of this practice. A history of passing cannot be written without telling her story too. Those who were left behind describe the pain and the loss of this act just as keenly as those who passed. So now what I want to do is show you a scene from the 1934 version of the famous film, Imitation of Life, where we'll see this problem unfolding, the denial of the darker mother by the lighter child who can pass and the heartbreak that such a denial causes the mother. This version of the film is quite interesting. There's also a version that was released in 1959. Um, but this version is, is really interesting because it's one of the few films about passing where the character who is black and who is passing as white is actually played by a black actress. So we're going to see Freddie Washington, um, the very famous uh, black actress. Um, playing the role of the, the character who's passing as white. Okay. Great. Can everyone see this? Okay, good. Okay. And I'm going to use the, the captions just so to make sure that you're able to, to read, to read the dialogue if you can't hear it. It's a very short clip. be the play. There she is, Miss B. Mm. How do you like your new job? Very much, thank you. for you. Viola, we've been looking everywhere for you. Are you talking to me? There must be some mistake. My name isn't Viola. There ain't no mistake. Why have you got this job? You don't have to work. I'll give you everything you want. What are you talking about? I'm sure you've got me confused with someone else. Well, 
Why, Beulah, child, I'm your mommy. Why, that's ridiculous. I never saw you before in my life. What's the meaning of this? This woman doesn't know what she's talking about. Do I look like her daughter? Do I look like I could be her daughter? Well, she must be crazy. Viola. How can you talk to your mother that way? Come on, Delala. Come on. Okay. 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 So passing is often presented as a story of gain. By passing as white, particularly during the years of segregation, one could access a range of employment opportunities that would be otherwise restricted. One could live in a better neighborhood. One could enjoy countless social privileges, like being addressed as Mr. or Mrs respectful titles reserved for white men and women only. But my cousin's story and the scene that I've just shown you from Imitation of Life demonstrates that to write a history of passing is to write a history of loss. The goal of my work is to explore not only what was gained by passing as white, but also what was lost by walking away from a black identity. Racial passing is an exile, sometimes chosen, sometimes not. From the late 18th century to the present in the United States, countless African-Americans passed as white, leaving behind families, friends, communities, and roots. Lives were lost only to be remembered in family stories like mine. So rather than seeing racial identity from the racial regime looking down on those who passed as white, I try to bring into focus what passers saw when they looked out onto their own worlds. Race was quite real to those who lived with it, not because of skin color or essentialist notions about biology, but because it was social and experiential because it involved one's closest relationships and one's most intimate communities. Passing often meant striking out on one's own and leaving behind a family and a people. Without a doubt, benefits accrued to these new white identities. But a more complete understanding of this practice requires a reckoning with the loss, the alienation, and the isolation that accompanied and often outweighed its rewards. So let me take a step back and offer some more historical context around this project. Racial passing in the United States is the focus of my project, but it must be acknowledged as only a subset of a much larger phenomenon that encompasses multiple disguises and forms of dissemblance. In the 19th century, as young men and women steadily migrated out of small farms to seek their fortunes in America's booming cities, American Victorians warned that these men and women might pass and enter higher social classes to which they did not belong, given the social fluidity of early 19th century America. While American Victorians were fretting over class passing, Jewish applicants changed their names to outmaneuver discriminatory admissions policies that limited their enrollments at universities, including Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Chinese immigrants disguised themselves to pass as Mexican and entered the US from the US-Mexico border during the era when the Chinese were excluded from immigrating to the United States. Loretta Vasquez, a Cuban born woman, passed as a Confederate soldier to fight in the Civil War and entered the ranks of numerous women 
who joined the military and participated in occupations and activities restricted to men. Gay men passed as straight, also known as, quote, putting their hair up married women and worked in professions that would have been unavailable to them if they had, quote, let their hair down. And Mez Mezro, the flamboyant jazz saxophonist born to Russian Jewish immigrants, passed as black to shore up his musical credentials. So here I have identified only a handful of examples of a sweeping phenomenon to demonstrate its flexibility and its adaptability to various historical contexts. The poor passed as the rich, women passed as men, Jews passed as Gentiles, gay men and women passed as straight, and whites sometimes passed as black. And of course, the reverse of any of these dyads was plausible given specific conditions and circumstances particularly in societies with relatively open and fluid social orders, the permutations on passing were endless. So now let me give you just a brief overview of my book, which spans the late 18th to the mid 20th century. The lived experience of passing, the act of negotiating the permeable border between black and white, reveals one way that everyday people have interacted with the racist society since the late 18th century. Each era determined not only how racially ambiguous men and women lived, but also what they lost. In the antebellum period, enslaved men and women lived with a looming threat of loss, knowing that they could be bought, sold, and forever separated from their families if their master lost a card game or decided to present a slave as a wedding gift. During the era of slavery, to pass as white was to escape, not necessarily from blackness, but from slavery, and often with the intention of recovering precious relationships and living as black under the more secure conditions of freedom. Passing as white became possible in a society where whiteness was not based solely on appearance, but also on dress, behavior, and mannerisms. Indeed, skin color and physical appearance were usually the least reliable factors. Racially ambiguous slaves drew on highly sophisticated understandings of gender, racial, and social norms to enact whiteness. And by doing so, many successfully passed to freedom. Let's take as an example, Ellen Craft, who passed as a white man, crossing both racial and gender lines to escape to freedom, while her darker skinned husband played the role of her slave. It was necessary for Ellen to pass as a man because she knew it was highly unconventional for a white woman to travel alone with a male slave. But the craft's convincing performance required far more than Ellen's white skin. It was Ellen's knowledge of how to dress and comport herself like a Southern gentleman and her subtle and nuanced understandings of Southern social and gender norms that made this daring undertaking a marvelous success. Concerned that her beardless face might betray her or that her illiteracy would prevent her from registering her name at hotels, Ellen became a master of improvisation. She bound her right hand in a sling so that she could ask others to sign her name for her. She bandaged her face so that no one would know that she did not have a beard. By feigning illness, disability, and even deafness, Ellen politely excused herself from conversation and won the sympathy of other travelers. In fact, it's been reported that Ellen played the role of a Southern gentleman so well that white Southern ladies swooned in her presence. Passing to freedom, however, 
was not merely as laden with the moral questions and experiences with loss that would follow in later years. During the Jim Crow era, segregated living and working arrangements created the necessary conditions for passing to flourish, but also for this practice to undermine Black families and communities. This period also witnessed the Great Migration, the massive and unprecedented migrations of African Americans out of the South that allowed racially ambiguous people to travel and to try on new identities in the anonymity of Northern cities. One woman described her grandmother's journey from Mississippi to Chicago. Once in Chicago and no longer immediately identifiable as Lula's daughter, her grandmother could easily enter the white world with no questions asked. This was one of the most common forms of passing during the Jim Crow era, working white while living black or nine to five passing as it was often called, which allowed nearly white men and women to access employment slated for whites only. Simply mentioning that a family member held a white collar job became shorthand for passing as white given the strict segregation of employment opportunities. Others passed temporarily or situationally to seek respite from Jim Crow living every now and then. In a 1932 letter to Carl Van Vechten, novelist Nella Larson passed while in, she described, the novelist Nella Larson described passing while in the company of another light-skinned woman. And here she writes to, to, to Van Vechten, you will be amused that I, who have never tried this much discussed passing stunt, have waited until I reached the deep south to put it over. Grace Johnson and I drove about 50 miles south of here the other day and then walked to the best restaurant in a rather conservative town called Murfreesboro and demanded lunch and got it, plus all the service in the world and an invitation to return. Everybody here seems to think that quite a stunt. Larson's letter reveals the type of momentary passing that became commonplace during the Jim Crow era, but it also reveals the fun and the theatrics of passing. Convincing performances required gumption, resourcefulness, and no small measure of humor. The sheer joy of getting over and fooling our white folks, as Langston Hughes put it, made passing a means of poking fun at a racial system laden with absurdities about racial purity. I want to say just a bit more about Nella Larson because Britt Bennett has also talked about how she read a novel that Larson wrote about passing, which is actually called Passing, um, while she was writing The Vanishing Half. So here's a slide. The, 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 the image on the left is actually an advertisement for the novel Passing. Um, that circulated in the late in, in circulated in 1929 when the novel was written, and then the image on the right is a picture of the cover of the most recent edition of Passing, which is um, a Norden critical edition of of Passing. Um, so, so the novel was published in 1929 at the end of the Harlem Renaissance. And it's a thrilling, powerful, and tragic novel that explores the intimate friendship between two Black women. One of, the wo one of the women is passing as white. The novel is alive with many of the questions that we are wrestling with in our own time, and also that Britt Bennett wrestles with in The Vanishing Half. Race, colorism, class differences, desire, sexuality, identity, and belonging. Nella Larson's novel begins when these two women who um, knew each other, they had been childhood friends 
unexpectedly encounter each other on the rooftop of a fancy hotel. One of the women, Irene Redfield, is bound by middle-class conventions. She is in a loveless but strategic marriage. She prizes her respectable middle-class life and she will defend it at all costs. The other woman, Claire Kendry, openly flouts racial norms, not only by passing as white, but by recklessly returning to Harlem um, because she misses black people. She wants to be around black people. And she describes this as a longing, um, as an ache and a pain that will never cease. Claire begs Irene to spend more time with her. And Irene feels uneasy about Claire's invitations, but she's also very curious. So as she explains, quote, there were things that she wanted to ask Claire Kendry. She wished to find out about this hazardous business of passing, this breaking away from all that was familiar and friendly to take one's chances in another environment, not entirely strange perhaps, but certainly not entirely friendly. Irene knows well that Claire is dangerous, but it's actually Irene's feelings for Claire and especially her sexual desire for Claire that are far more alarming to Irene. Irene also worries that her husband may be in love with Claire, which would threaten the picture perfect life that Irene has worked so hard to build. So the reader can feel that this novel will not end happily. Irene's desperation, her knowledge of her husband's deep unhappiness and her desire for some measure of control over her life will lead her to act dangerously, impulsively, and even murderously. So I won't give away the ending, um, no spoilers here, um, but, but I think for those of you who really enjoyed The Vanishing Half, I think you, you would also really enjoy passing um, and particularly knowing that it influenced Britt Bennett as she was writing. So, Larson very interestingly suggests that there are really no available avenues for women like Claire Kendry or Irene Redfield. And perhaps this is why her novels end in tragedy. There's a feeling that these black women are suffocating and that they are strangled by an inflexible and unforgiving racial and gender regime. Britt Bennett explains that she first encountered this novel when she was in college and that she immediately fell in love with it. And she was particularly interested in the character of Claire's bigoted husband and kept him in mind when she was writing The Vanishing Half. As Bennett explained, quote, I remembered thinking about Claire's husband and thinking about what type of man Stella would marry. Because in passing, when you first meet Claire's husband, there's just this immediate upping of the stakes of, of passing because you can feel that her husband is, is a bigot. And there's this question of what is he going to do when he finds out that his wife is actually black. And so as, as Britt Bennett continues, quote, he's going to lose it when he finds out. It makes you really stressed when you're reading the book. I wanted to think of Stella marrying this white man who thinks of himself as being one of the good white people in the world. And I think that it seems a bit more interesting and different to me than the obvious, which would be to have made him a kind of obvious or as Britt Bennett writes, a kind of by the book racist. Um, yes, so so again, I think I think many of you would enjoy reading Passing as well and to kind of see where where Britt Bennett perhaps was influenced by some of the characters and the themes in Passing. So, okay, so let's return now to our discussion of the historical context of Passing and the ways that the phenomenon of Passing was shaped by particular time periods. 
Walter White, who was the racially ambiguous executive secretary of the NAACP, made a practice of putting his blonde hair and blue eyes to use to enter the South during the 1920s to investigate lynching. White must have laughed nervously when he sat next to a white man on a train who bragged that he had a special expertise in identifying blacks who passed as white. Taking White's hand into his own and pointing at White's cuticles, the white man explained that if Walter White had black blood, it would show on his fingernails. And this was an antiquated belief about a telltale sign of black racial identity. So in a country obsessed with racial distinctions, passing demonstrated just how unreliable one's appearance was in determining one's race. So at times passing was a practical joke at the expense of whites, but this levity must not obscure the high emotional stakes, the threats to familial coherence and the personal pain that this practice necessitated. One of the most heart-wrenching stories of passing that I discovered in the archives is that of Elsie Roxborough, who was born to a storied African-American family. She chose to pass as white after she graduated from the University of Michigan in 1937. Her story ends in tragedy. She took her own life in 1949. During the Great Depression, the Roxborough family lived a life that few Americans, black or white, could have imagined. They had maids and chauffeurs. Elsie rode horses and drove her father's cars. The family vacationed with other black elites at Idlewild, a lakefront resort in Western Michigan, nicknamed the Black Eden. Langston Hughes wrote that Elsie would often tell him her dreams and wonder whether or not it would be better for her to pass as white to achieve them. After college, Elsie moved to New York. She dyed her brown hair red and dropped the famous Roxborough name to become the unattached white Mona Manet. But even as a white woman, her dreams would not come true. And this is an image of her when she was living in New York and passing as a white woman. When Elsie's white roommate returned from a weekend trip, she found Elsie in her bed and it appeared that Elsie had committed suicide. Her sister, who could also pass as white, traveled to New York with the wrenching assignment of claiming the body. The arrival of this ostensibly white woman allowed Elsie to remain white, even in death. Elsie had written to her father for financial help. He refused her and three days later, she was dead. Her sister would never speak to her father again. By the 1940s and through the 1960s, personal testimonies began to declare that the losses were simply too much to bear, that for those who were passing, it was time to give up and come home. The black press published numerous testimonials of African-Americans who disavowed passing and cataloged the countless psychological advantages of embracing a black identity. Many articles cheerfully announced the collapse of economic barriers after World War II that seemed to make nine to five passing no longer necessary. Other essays focused on the collective pride that African-Americans experienced and the growing protest spirit of the burgeoning civil rights movement. The Johnson family showed here shown here in their suburban home in Keene, New Hampshire, passed for 20 years before they were discovered. The father, a successful and well-respected radiologist, applied to be an officer in the Navy during World War II. A Naval background check revealed that he had been in a black fraternity during college. Now note to self, 
if you plan to pass, you might not want to join a black fraternity, but he did. And eventually the family secret would be revealed. And once it was, they insisted that they were through with passing and that they would never pass again. By the 1960s, racial politics had changed once again. Black identities were affirmed and passing was rejected. Black was beautiful. Blending in with the white world seemed no longer economically necessary, politically advantageous or socially desirable. So I am often asked, do people still pass today? And many of you may remember the story of Rachel Dolezal, which made national news in June of 2015. She claimed that she was black and had identified as black even as a child, though her parents insisted that she was in fact white. More recently, Jessica Krug, an associate professor of history at George Washington University, posted a sort of a confession on the platform Medium, explaining that she was not who she had claimed to be. As she explained, quote, to an escalating degree over my adult life, I have eschewed my lived experience as a white Jewish child in suburban Kansas City within a blackness that I had no right to claim. So I am certain that passing continues today, but probably in very different forms than what I have described in my talk. We now live in a far more multiracial society than Ellen Craft or Elsie Roxborough could have ever imagined. The conditions of the 21st century allow for a greater acceptance of mixed race identities, but still the core issues of race and identity remain. Each generation must navigate the social currents and racial realities of their time period. A history of passing opens a window on the complexity of the human experience. It allows us to gain a deeper and more meaningful understanding of the ways that race is lived and experienced. And I hope that telling the history of passing can lead to a deeper understanding of the human condition and the universality of the experience of loss. Some Americans, some African Americans used passing as a crucial channel leading to physical and personal freedom. They declared their rights as American citizens and insisted on their humanity. But what they could not have fully known until they had successfully passed was that the light of freedom was often overshadowed by the darkness of loss. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I would love to answer any questions or hear comments. All right, so I'm gonna switch so I can see everybody here now. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, we can raise your hand. I see some of you, I don't see all of you. So um, you can just unmute yourselves, I'll let you. I give, give you the power to unmute yourself and ask a question. Everybody's gonna be shy. And please feel free, you can ask me anything at all, anything about um, uh, the book or about the history of passing or any of the, the examples, really anything at all. So I have a question, they're, 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 getting, they're getting their thinking caps on now. <laughs> um, who was Bud Billiken? Oh, that's a great question. So, so Bud Billiken was actually like, I believe he was a fictional character who was sort of like, almost like Santa Claus in a way. He was kind of like a, um, like sort of a, 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 a larger than life figure who was really, um, really in touch with children, very much like a, 
a, a, a person who loved children and wanted to celebrate children. And so the Bud Billiken parade was always known as a back to school parade. And it was sort of meant to be kind of like the last hurrah for children um, before school started. And it was always through Washington Park, through this one park um, on the south side of Chicago. Um, and it was always kind of this fun thing that children would participate in that sort of signaled the end of the summer and the, the, the beginning of, of the, the school year. Um, this one's from Peggy. How were the Imitation of Life movies received in their time? That is such a great question. So they were actually, it, it's, it's very interesting to read reviews of, of um, both of the films because one, one thing that sort of happens is that the story of the mother's pain, which you can see in that clip that I showed you, it becomes so, it, it, it very much kind of um, overshadows the plot of passing. So the fact that Freddie Washington, the actor that plays the woman who's passing as white, the fact that she's really making some very powerful statements about racism and She's, she's, she's really sort of trying to kind of get her mother to see the kind of injustice of racism. Um, that that sort of gets overshadowed by the pain that she causes her mother. And so there's a very, so here's a spoiler. There's a very famous scene at the end where the mother dies really of a broken heart. She's so upset that she's lost her daughter, that her daughter has, has decided to pass as white. Um, she's done everything that she can for her daughter. She pays for her to go to um, a kind of fancy, historically black college and her daughter is still very unhappy there. Um, and so she ends up kind of running away and they lose contact. Um, and the mother dies um, and, it, and it really is that she's dying of a broken heart. And the last scene is at that you see the, the mother's funeral and the daughter arrives kind of like right at the end and she kind of collapses on her mother's casket and she's crying and you know it's, you can tell that she feels so terrible that she's done the, you know, that she's, she's created so much pain for her mother. So what, what sort of happens in most of the reviews is that most people say, you know, this is really a heartbreaking story. And this, this child is so ungrateful and she's caused her mother's death because of this desire to be white and to pass as white. So you can, and you can kind of imagine in 1934 that that would be the, the response to the movie that, that people would sort of feel that, you know, here's this woman who in many ways is, is trying to access whiteness that she doesn't deserve. And then it has such horrible consequences for her mother and she is ungrateful. And um, so, so most of the reviews basically are saying that that the that the real story that they're focusing on is this sadness of the mother and and all of the, what the mother goes through to try to kind of re, reunite with her daughter. There's one review that I read that I thought was so fascinating because it was written in 1934, and the author says, you know, actually, that storyline really is so compelling and so fascinating and so engrossing. And so this one reviewer says, you know, actually like this is the story that we really should be paying attention to. Like this is what's really interesting that this character is really openly and powerfully talking about how horrible racism is and, and, and the kinds of, um, 
the, 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 the injustices and the, the indignities and, you know, all of the, the insults that, um, that black people are experiencing. Um, I will just say that, that it's important to note that the film is actually more about Claudette Colbert. So the, in the, in the scene that, that, that I showed you, there's a white woman who, who, who says to, to Freddie Washington, to the daughter, you know, how could you talk to your mother that way? Um, she's really the protagonist. And so the film is much more about her life and it's much more about her. She ends up becoming very wealthy because she, um, she she's actually a single mother. She ends up becoming very wealthy um, by using the black mother's pancake recipe to kind of create this empire. Um, so, so she becomes very wealthy and the story is, the, 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 the film is much more about her and the story about passing is kind of like a sub, a kind of subplot to the, to the film, but um, it definitely becomes, you know, very captivating and very, you know, a lot of, a lot of readers and reviewers end up talking more about that storyline curious about the Johnson family and um, you were saying that they passed for white. So were they passing as Italian Americans? That's, that's so interesting. So, so they passed as white, um, but when, when, when it came out, so, so basically they passed as white, they moved to Keene, New Hampshire. Um, the father was, was a blue on here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, so the father was this very well-known radiologist. Um, they lived in this beautiful home. They lived in like the most beautiful house in the town. Um, and they, they, their neighbors explained that once it came out that they had been passing as white, once it came out that they were actually black, their neighbors said, you know, we never thought that they weren't white because they lived a life that we associated with white people. So we couldn't really even imagine that they were anything other than white. And so when pressed, some of the neighbors said, well, you know, we did have some doubts. We did kind of think like, well, maybe they're Italian, like, like, like you said, or maybe they're Puerto Rican, or maybe they are something, maybe they're not like, maybe, maybe they, maybe they, they, they are of some color, but, but, but they still really doubted that they still really didn't think that because they just associated the idea that this family could be so wealthy, that the father could be so successful, that the mother could be such a great hostess. She belonged to all of the right social clubs. Um, she, she was actually Catholic, but she, she, she kind of converted to being Presbyterian, which she felt was another way of kind of being less associated with perhaps being Italian or perhaps being, um, you know, having a kind of more ethnic identity and feeling that being Presbyterian would make her sort of more white. Um, she had the church's Christmas party at her house every year. So there was this whole way that the family lived that really made their neighbors and, and everyone around them, the, the father's patients and, and everyone around them really made them believe that they were white. And so I think that that story is really interesting because it, it really shows you just how much whiteness is a kind of construction, how much um, whiteness does rely on behavior as well, that it was kind of the behavior and the actions and the, the self-presentation of the Johnston family that also really solidified their, their whiteness. 
Um, are there any accounts of people who passing as white getting outed and punished or divorced? And was there fear that they would have children with darker skin than theirs? Yes, so that's a great question. So that there, there were, there was definitely a lot of fear about this. So in a lot of novels and um, films about passing, there will often be some storyline about, um, you know, a a, a, a a woman being very afraid that she's going to have a baby who may not look white. Um, and this actually comes up in the, 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 the story of the Johnstons was made into a film called Lost Boundaries in 1949. And there's a part in that film where um, the, the, the wife is pregnant and she's talking about how she's nervous about, you know, what the baby will look like. But then there's also a scene where once the baby is born that she can kind of breathe a sigh of relief because the fact that she's now produced a white looking child is yet another way that her identity as a white woman is solidified. Um, but there were a lot of cases where um, someone was passing as white and they married a white person and then they were outed um, and the marriages were annulled or they were they, they did get divorced. Um, so so that definitely does come up um, and there's there's a kind of there there are a few very famous cases where that that happened and and you know it was it was very embarrassing to the white family that their child had married somebody who was actually black and was passing as white. Um, so so yeah, that's that's a that's a great question and definitely there was a lot of anxiety and and there's there there's an interesting um, uh, there's a great book by Philip Roth called The Human Stain, which eventually was made into a movie. Um, and in the human stain, it's a man who's passing as white. And he, Philip Roth has this really incredible paragraph where he's describing um, the, the main character. The main character's name is Coleman Silk. And Coleman is talking about how he's decided that he's going to choose um, a Jewish woman to marry because he feels like if he marries a Jewish woman who has curly hair, that when they have a baby, if the baby somehow has curly hair, Coleman can blame that on uh, his wife. And there's, there's a really interesting passage where basically he says, you know, he wasn't sure if, you know, he loved his wife because he loved her or if he loved her because she was part of, she was, she was one component of, um, she was one way that he was able to maintain this identity as a white man. Interesting. I should just say this though, that it was very rare for a black person who was passing as white to be outed by another black person. So there are, there are these stories and, they, and some of them are very sensational. Um, but when you look at the historical record, it's pretty unusual. And I think that that largely just had to do with the fact that like many black people understood the difficulties and the 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 horrors of, of racism and of living in a racist society and felt that passing was one way to kind of get over or as Langston Hughes said to to fool white folks and that given how given all of the limitations given all of the restrictions given all of the constraints of segregated life that if it was possible to pass, that a black person should do that. Now, other people felt that that was a kind of um, almost like being sort of like a race traitor, or they felt that it was not the right thing to do. It wasn't morally right. It wasn't ethically right. 
Um, but for the most part, most black people kept the secret. Okay, can you, sorry, I'm scrolling, scrolling around, I'm hopping around a little bit. Um, Den asks, please explain the difference between someone saying they are black passing as white versus being mixed race and being largely white. And, and what was the last part and being? Largely white or mostly white. Right, so, so this is a really, this is a great question too. I think that one thing is that we live in a very different kind of world today than, you know, many of the people that I'm describing in my talk were living in a world where there was really no in between. There, there really wasn't a concept of a mixed race identity that you were black or you were white. And that's part of what makes passing so kind of sensational or that's what makes it kind of so dramatic in the United States, in the context of the United States, because we've always had such a kind of bipolar racial arrangement in the United States. And I think that has changed recently, you know, so maybe like since the late sixties, if we think about like the Loving versus Virginia Supreme Court case, um, when, when the Supreme Court finally did say that interracial marriage was, was, was legal and was constitutional. Um, but if we think about that, I mean, that's still fairly recent. That case was decided in 1968, um, or sorry, in 1967. Um, and so, after that, we kind of entered a new, a new kind of environment where there was, I mean, there has always been racial mixture. Let me, let me make that very clear that, that there's always been racial mixture. Um, and often it was forced. I mean, often it was rape. It was the rape of black women who were enslaved by white slave owners. Um, so there's always been, um, and, and, you know, and this is something that comes up in the vanishing half, there's always been, um, you know, a large portion of our population that's, that, that's very light skinned. Um, but I think that even, even, even still, it's, it's really only quite recently that we now talk about and have a category um, of, of mixed race. Um, and I guess I'm saying it's only recently because as a historian that like 1967 feels recent, you know, as thinking, thinking historically. Um, so, so I think that, that, that now we, we're much more, we're much more aware of, or we're much more, um, we, we talk about racial mixture. We talk about mixed race identities, um, you know, much, much more than, than we would have in the 1940s or the 1950s. You know, at that time it was, you were black or you were white. And even if you were very light skinned, even if you would be mistaken as white regularly, if you had black ancestry, if you had a black parent, then you were considered black. And so I think that that the, the terminology that we use now really is a reflection of, um, of a new kind of, a new, a, a new way of thinking about race and a way of thinking about race that really does take into account racial mixture. Um, I'm, I'm going back to a topic you kind of covered already, but this um, question came in. What happened to the Johnsons after they were outed? Right. So, so it's a great question. So, um, so, you know, I should just also just, just to, just to say one more thing about the last question, I should also just say that I think that, that this has also changed the way that people identify. So I think people now can say I'm mixed race or I'm biracial or, you know, 
And that's understandable. People understand what they're saying. Whereas like when I was doing the research on this and on this book, and I was looking at um, a writer from the Harlem Renaissance, um, a writer named Gene Toomer, and he was from a racially mixed background. Um, and he would say, so this was, so he was writing dur during the Harlem Renaissance, during the 1920s. And he would tell people, well, I'm racially mixed. I'm not black and I'm not white. And he wrote about it very eloquently. You know, he would say like, you know, to, to not understand all of my parts is to not understand who I am. That like, you should really sort of think about me in a much more complex way than what people of the time did. And no one listened to him. I mean, it was almost like people thought that he was, you know, just that, that, that what he was saying just didn't even make sense. You know, it was sort of like, no, you're a black man. You look, he, I mean, he, 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 he looked somewhat racially ambiguous, but for the most part, I think most people would have identified him as being black. Um, and so, you know, it was sort of like, we can't even understand why you would say that you're not black. Um, so, so again, you know, there's a huge shift from what was possible during that period um, compared to, to, to what, what we've, what, what is possible today. Um, it's interesting because I would see it as similar as today though, if you have, if you have a white mom, black dad, or, you know, and you look black, I feel like we still see the black, you know, like I think that as society, we still do that. Right, right. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So with the Johnstons, um, there, it's a there. It's a fascinating story. They stayed in Keene for so they were they were discovered in nineteen, I think it was nineteen forty one. It was like at the beginning of World War II when the father decided to apply to the Navy. Um, to be an officer in the Navy. And then they did a background check and they discovered that he had been a member of this black fraternity. Um, and at that point, oh, and I'm sorry, I hope my dog doesn't start barking. Uh, at that point, um, after they did the background check, they explained that, you know, he could not be an officer in the Navy because at that time, if you were black, you couldn't be an officer in the Navy. Um, and so, I'm so sorry. I have dog too. Totally get it. <laughs> I I think probably a dog is probably a dog is walking by, and as soon as the dog walks by, she'll she'll be quiet again. Um, so so um, at that point, um, the family was essentially it was their their secret had been revealed. What's interesting is that they waited until like 1947 to announce it to their neighbors and their friends and the, 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 the community. And once they did, it became a huge story. I mean, they were featured in a number of magazines. Um, they were featured in Ebony Magazine and Life Magazine and Look Magazine. There was this, the, there was a film that was made about them um, and they really became kind of like celebrities. And what, what was interesting was that in Ebony Magazine and all of the, the interviews, they, they said, you know, we were treated just the same. Like once our neighbors found out it was no big deal, the neighbors accepted us. And, and in fact, um, some of these magazines then sort of used this story as a way of saying integration is on the horizon. Like here's an example of a black family that was living in a white neighborhood and, and it came out that they were black and everything was fine. Like this is a great story. This is a great way for Americans to see that like integration is possible and it can and it will happen. 
A few years later, the family leaves Keene, New Hampshire, and they move to Hawaii. And so this was like by 1953, I think they were in Hawaii. And at that point, they they kind of revealed a little bit more about their story. And it turned out that the father had been fired or he had been kind of like pushed out of the hospital where he worked. And that the, that the treatment that it seemed as though they had received um, was actually not nearly as friendly and as neighborly as, as the reality. Um, so they ended up moving to Hawaii and their children, um, I, I, I think I think all of their children grew ended up growing up in Hawaii unless some of them maybe did stay. I, I think they were young enough that they would have moved with the parents to Hawaii. Um, but now most of the family lives in Los Angeles. And I think most of the family identifies as white. So I think many of the, I think they, they had, I believe three, three children, three or four children, and they, they married, I think the children married um, white partners. And I think they, they identify now as, as white, but they, but they are very proud of that, of the story and and you know, very. Um, it, it's not at all like they don't want anyone to know about that history or that story. They're they're very very proud of that story. Huh. All right, another question. Oh, go ahead. Father, oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say that the father actually became like a spokesperson for the NAACP, <laughs> and he would give speeches and talk about about you know how obvious and how unfair racism was in the United States because he would he would talk about how when he was first applying after he had graduated from medical school he was applying for residence residencies and um, he talked about how when when he, wait, wait, sorry <laughs> the funny thing is I have like I have this like very sweet, gentle labradoodle. I don't know if you can see her as she like is running around here, but um, she's such, she's like this fluffy, sweet dog and her bark sounds <laughs> so different than what she looks like. Like people can, cannot believe that that, 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 that this precious little dog is making like, such has such a loud bark, but um, I just heard my dog who heard your dog just come in and start whining like, oh, what, what's that? <laughs> that's, right. always that's always that's always so funny when dogs can hear each other. Through <laughs> um, so so the father explained that when he was applying for when he when he graduated from medical school and he was applying for positions that he had such a struggle, it was almost impossible for him to get a job. And then once he decided to either not put his race on his applications or once he actually identified as white, then he was getting just numerous jobs. And so he talked a lot about that when he was speaking for the NAACP, you know, to think about how unfair it was that, you know, once he presented himself as white, you know, he, he was able to get all of these jobs and it really showed, you know, just how unfair things were that obviously he, he was the same person, had the same education, had the same credentials. Um, but as a, as a black person, he was not able to get any positions. I wonder if he was ever tempted to switch to pass again, you know, like move to, you know, when he moved, if you thought about, mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think that they, when they moved to Hawaii, I think they kind of just allowed people to accept them as they, whatever they sort of 
thought they, I don't think they necessarily said we are black. I don't know if they like announced sure. themselves, but maybe they just sort of allowed people to kind of accept them as take them for whatever they believe that they were. And then that's also very interesting that they chose Hawaii, which is of course a more kind of multiracial um, environment than Keene, New Hampshire was, for example. All right, another question for you. Did there evolve an art of passing that involved cosmetics and hair care that spilled into non-passing people? Oh, that's really interesting. So the question is, did people who were passing use cosmetics or wigs or, and then did that then evolve? Did that then, I'm not sure if I caught the second part of the question. Um, it said, did they evolve an art of passing that involved cosmetics and hair care that spilled into non-passing people? So maybe if you were passing and you were using, you know, the white people's cosmetics and stuff, did that spill back into, that's, I'm guessing that's what the question means. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I think for the most part, people didn't really do a lot of making up or, or, you know, they, they didn't do, they didn't, they didn't do very much of that. Um, I mean, I think that they, they probably kind of accentuated their certain features. Um, I don't know whether, like, I, I'm not sure how they did that cosmetically, like how, how they did that with makeup, but, but I think for, from what I've read, it seems as though, um, you know, people may have may have used cosmetics to accentuate accentuate certain features um but but not not so much because i think that the that that the real issue was that 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 i mean this sort of comes back to this idea that you know once you could behave in a certain way once once you spoke in a certain way once you had particular mannerisms, sort of like the Johnstons, you know, once like they were able to convince people that they were white, largely by their behavior and largely by the way they lived, largely by sort of their, their class position, their, their socioeconomic position. Um, so that's an interesting question. I mean, I'm sure that people did, you know, use cosmetics or use different, you know, wigs or hair, you know, I'm sure that there were things that they did, but I think for the most part, um, it was more a kind of way of being, it was more a way of presenting oneself. Like even that quote that I read from Nella Larson, where, you know, she says, well, you know, I went to this beautiful restaurant and I just walked in with confidence and they accepted me as being white. They, they, they believed that I was white and they treated me really well. Um, and so it, it wasn't necessarily anything that she did cosmetically. It was just sort of her demeanor um, and her confidence and her, her, her kind of sense of like, of course I should be treated you know, of course I should be accepted in this restaurant. And there's a lot of stories like that where, you know, someone is not trying to pass, but they are taken as white. People believe that they're white. And there's a really fascinating story about a man, a man who identified as black. Um, and he was sent, he was, he was a member of ROTC and he was sent to the University of Mississippi in the 1940s. And um, when he got there, everyone thought he was white. And so he got his student ID and it was stamped or it was, it was, he was listed as white on his student ID. And he thought to himself, well, okay, I mean, if, if, people here are going to believe that I'm white, then I might as well enjoy these privileges. 
And so he, he, it's, it's kind of a fascinating story because he talks about how he dated white women. You know, he, um, he joined the track team. He did all of these things at Ole Miss, which was considered and, you know, which prided itself on being entirely white. Um, and here he was you know, having a great time as a student there and no one was the wiser. And then in 1961, when James Meredith integrated Old Miss, which set off all kinds of protests and violence and, you know, a really rabid reaction to the idea of a black man attending Old Miss, this man who had attended in the 1940s and you know no one knew that he was actually black he wrote an article saying you know they are fighting a fight now that they don't realize they lost decades ago wow well we have time maybe for one more question anybody have one I'd love to hear what people thought about um, the vanishing half. I think, you know, just, just comments or thoughts about, about that book and about the, some Is of the things you want to share. Yeah. Everybody's quiet. Well, I really enjoyed the book. I am from New Orleans. So I, I know, uh, uh, and that's why I asked you the question about the Johnsons, because I'm thinking, well, no way they look white. But um, I, I thought it was a very good book. It was really sad. At, at parts of it was really sad, but I really enjoyed the book. Yeah. You know, there's that really interesting scene where Stella has to, like, kind of perform this racist whiteness. You know, um, and I, I, I thought about that, you know, with the Johnstons kind of wondering if they were ever in a sort of similar kind of situation like that where, and, and so this is actually interesting, like the, the person who asked the question about, you know, did people sort of use cosmetics or how did they, how did they um, sort of solidify their whiteness? And in some ways, um, you know, it's interesting that in the vanishing half for Stella, being white meant being racist. You know, it meant it meant it meant having to to talk about black people in, in particular ways so that people would assume or people would believe her as being white. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting stories about black people who kind of decided like they just did not want to pass anymore. And partly they would say, well, you know, I had to listen to people telling racist jokes and making really horrific comments and I just couldn't take it anymore. So I just kind of gave up. There's one story that I read in the archives about a woman who was passing as well and um, <laughs> one day. And um, her coworkers were wanting to help her and, you know, were saying, oh, like, let us take you home, you know, let us, let us help you. And, and she, she realized that she was in this horrible situation where, you know, she couldn't have a coworker take her home to, you know, she couldn't have a white person see where she lived because she lived in a black neighborhood. This was someone who was passing, like doing the nine to five passing. So just passing to work and then, you know, living as a black woman at, at, at home. And she just realized that she was in this terrible position where she couldn't have anybody take her home, but then she also couldn't have anybody call her husband or call her mother or call anybody who could help her either. Um, because then her her secret would be revealed. So it, it's a it's a very complicated 
thing. I mean, it's a very, it's a very complicated phenomenon. And I think that that was part of why I really wanted to try to look at the loss of it, like to, to, because I think people do associate passing more with gaining. They associate it with like all of the privileges of being white and the socioeconomic advantages and, you know, all of these things. But I think it's really important to also think about like all that, that the people who passed lost um, and what, what those losses might have, have meant, meant to them. Yeah, I'll admit that I never thought about that. You know, I mean, and when I started reading, you know, some of your work and, and obviously with the vanishing half, it just really hit me like, oh my gosh, of course. And I couldn't imagine giving up all, all my past. I just couldn't. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I had never thought about that either until my aunt told me this story about my family and you know, all of a sudden it just really made me think very differently because I had read novels about passing, like I had read Nella Larson's novel or I had, you know, seen movies about passing and and I had never really thought about the, um, I, had, I just had never really thought about the costs of it. I had never really thought about like what what that would mean to have to actually turn away from your entire family, to have to walk by your mother on the street and not be able to acknowledge her um, or all of these other ways that it's a, it's a real kind of breaking away and a real, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's very painful. It, it, it can be something that, that's, that's very, very painful and very isolating. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I thought I really liked the book also. I, I thought the, um, the relationship uh, between Kennedy when Judd first, you know, uh, confronts her and, you know, she, it's easy for her not to believe her because how could you possibly be my cousin? You know, there's, there's nothing, nothing, you know, and, and that your mother is my mother's twin sister. You know, she couldn't even fathom, you know, that that could even be possible, but then, you know, it keeps gnawing at her and gnawing at her and gnawing at her. So, and I liked that, you know, the serendipity of them crossing paths again and things and, you know, confronting, you know, the truths kind of comes back to haunt you all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of things that I think Britt Bennett does that are, that are really fascinating. Like the idea of, you know, using twins and she's talked about um, the idea of twins as having this like deep connection and that that would then sort of underscore the loss because it would underscore that sense of like the kind of unnaturalness of like these twins being separated for this, particularly for this reason. Um, or, or the way that like the theater becomes a, a, a kind of element of, or acting, you know, becomes an element of the book and, and the way that, you know, when we think about passing, it certainly is very theatrical in many ways. Um, so there's a lot of things that I think she does in the book that kind of like, that, that really nicely kind of align with the themes uh, around passing. I'm going to get two more comments in here quick. One is, um, Adam found this, and everybody should be able to see this in their chat. This is, hey, I found a story on the U of Mississippi student written by the Allison Hobbs. So <laughs> link to that story for you in the chat. So if anybody would like to read more about that. <laughs> I'm so glad that he found that because as I was talking, I was thinking like, am I, am I telling this? And I, I'm like, I think I read an article and then I'm like, oh wait, I think I wrote that article. <laughs> Now I can't remember all of the details, but it's such a, it's a fascinating story. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting story, particularly when you think about old Miss. I mean, if there ever was a place that so prided itself on being exclusively white and was so willing to fight to maintain that. And then this man is, there and is black. And then I think, I think he was only there for one year and then he ended up going to Morehouse 
after. So then, you know, which is a historically black college. So, so the idea, like you, you can almost just picture like the registrar's office at the University of, of Mississippi and, you know, they're processing this paperwork and they've got this student from Old Miss who now is leaving to go to Morehouse. And like, you know, you, you almost wonder like, did they think, did they, did they think about what that meant? Or were they sort of like, okay, um, somebody made a mistake at some point, like, we're just gonna let this go, you know, like, let's not, let's not draw too much attention to this, you know. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it's a really kind of fascinating story. And it just shows you, I mean, you know, it's so, it's so interesting with race altogether, because on the one hand, it has so much meaning and it over determines so many things. I mean, you know, particularly like just thinking about this period that we're living through right now. I mean, the ways that COVID has disproportionately affected um, black and brown people, the, 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 the horrific examples and horrific incidences that we're seeing with police violence. And I mean, there's just so many ways that race is, is so, um, it, it, it really over determines people's life circumstances. Um, and it, and it's such a, such a, 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 a point of division in, in our, in our society. Um, but then at the same time, it's just, it's, it's, it's also, it's, it's just interesting to think about how like, it has so much social meaning. It has so much social meaning, so much political meaning, so much economic meaning. But then when you really think about it, like there's not that much behind it, you know, like there's not like, if someone can pass as white, if someone, you know, there, there, there were laws in, in there, there were laws about, you know, how much black blood you had to have to be considered black or to be considered white. And, you know, the laws in South Carolina were stricter than the laws in North Carolina. So you could literally be a white person. You could literally be identified as white in South Carolina and then cross a state line and be black and then be identified as black. You know, so it's like, it's, it's kind of ridiculous on the one hand, like when you think about it, but then on the other hand, it's just so real. And, and I mean, I think this is why I often don't like to say, you know, well, race is a social construction. You know, we sort of teach, that's the way like often when we're talking about race in, in school, we talk about it as like, well, race is a social construction. We know it's not based in biology, you know, but at the same time, it's like, to explain that on the one hand it's a social construction and there's no biological basis to it, but then on the other hand, it means absolutely everything to people who who live with with race. You know, it 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 has such a profound impact on our lives and our society. And you know, so it's 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 a it's such it's very complicated, but it's also very fascinating at the same time. I think that's an excellent spot to end things on. Um, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, there are, I don't know if you can see the chats now. I told you, I told her she didn't have to watch the chats, but there's a bunch of thank yous coming up. Um, oh, oh, thank you. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Oh, I love this idea about, um, the confusion in the registrar's office at Morehouse is the opening scene for the movie script. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, you could sort of, you could imagine almost like the confusion at Old Miss in one scene and then the confusion <laughs> at Morehouse, uh, you know, in the other scene. Yeah, that, that's great. That's great. Adam, thank if you want to record that, I'll, I'll hook the two of you up. You can make a movie together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your fantastic questions and comments. And thank you so much for, for joining this, this conversation. It's been a real pleasure to have the chance to talk to you all about passing.
Well, thank you so much. And if, for those of you who don't know, um, Allison does have TED Talks and she writes for a bunch of magazines. Just Google her name. It'll, you'll get all kinds of great things, great work that she's done. Um, she has another book, is it published about traveling, right? You know, I was hoping that it would be published soon, but I had to kind of stop some of the research because so it's on the American road trip and it's on kind of the experiences of African-Americans traveling and the difficulty that African-Americans have had traveling. Um, and I was doing a lot of traveling to write the book of, so that I could kind of experience the road trip myself. And, um, and I haven't been able to do it during, during COVID. So I'm hoping to be able to get back to that once things get a little bit better. We have a request. Can we see your cute dog? <laughs> oh yeah, Clover. Clover, come, come, loves. Okay, let's see if she'll. We need to see her now. You know, dog lovers need to see these. <laughs> she loves to be on. Oh, look at her! <laughs> I know she's actually like a little bit bigger. Well, let's see. Then, gosh, can you? Can you? Oh, see? <laughs> super cute. Thanks. Melissa, she looks like your dog, only white. <laughs> yeah, and a little fluffier because I just gave my dog a haircut. <laughs> do you have a lab? Do you have a labradoodle? I have an Airedale, so they have those bushy, you know, uh -huh. I love Airedales. I love Airedales. Those are they are so adorable. Yes, yeah, she 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 has the Airedale look because Airedales are kind of thin. Is that yep. right? Faces yep. are kind of pointy. <laughs> Yeah, and especially like if like she's she's not quite as thin now because she has a lot of fur, like she's very furry. Yeah, it's time, it's time for her to get her hair cut. Um, but but yeah, she has that kind of face. So those are such adorable dogs. I'm glad we got to see yours since we got to hear her. And you're right, the bark is a lot bigger than the fluffy cuteness. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, well. Thank you so much. We'll look to, um, I'm going to be keeping an eye out for your next book um, because I think that that's a fascinating topic too. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure, a real pleasure to, to have this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was great meeting you. Thanks for, for letting us learn with you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.